Welcome to Garner's Greek Mythology. This is Patrick Garner. I'm a mythologist and the author of three novels. They constitute a trilogy and have one theme. That is, that the ancient Greek gods are here now and that they never left. Join me as we walk with them on a unique journey. What has been lost in the modern interpretation of so-called mythology will come to life again. Like my books, Garner's Greek Mythology Podcast looks at the ancient gods assuming they are alive among us. For just a moment, I want you to suspend your disbelief. This is episode two of Garner's Greek Mythology. Today, I'm taking you back in time to a world ruled by gods. Thus, this podcast focuses on one thing, Greek gods, of course. And as I discussed in episode one of our series, the ancient gods are not fanciful imaginary beings. They are here now, which makes this series unique. First, we look at these gods as no one else in this field does. And second, in these episodes, we'll walk with the ancient divinities as if they are alive among us. In this podcast, they have never died. So I ask you, what if they were never myths? Imagine them wandering among us, observing, continuing to play out their own fascinating lives. Doesn't that fly in the face of everything we've been taught? And today we'll focus on why the Greek gods retreated from their high roofs in the ancient world, one that revolved around their every blessing. A moment ago I said retreated, that the Greek gods may have retreated. Really, who gives up their throne so easily? You probably assume the gods were no more real than characters in a fairy tale. After all, that's what all the books say. That's what you'll read on the web. The gods were merely allegorical. Well, that's an intellectual cop-out. It's an utterly safe position to take. No one today imagines Apollo, Athena, or Artemis as being more than inventions. If you do, you're called a romantic or something even less complimentary. Dictionaries define myth as a widely held but false belief. But what if all of this is wrong? What if, what if the backstory is somehow more complicated? What if these beings are not a myth? And if they're real, what if they never disappeared? Okay, but if they're real, you think, then why aren't they around throwing thunderbolts? Consider this. What if, as I said earlier, they simply retreated? That's what I found in my novels, and that's what the characters revealed. Rather than disappearing at some point in the distant past, they actually just left and moved on to other pursuits. How could they have given up such immense power? Who steps off their throne and walks away doing so without regret? But let's pause and look at this from the Greek point of view. I believe the answer lies there. Why were the gods so important to the ancient Greeks and then they weren't? Did the Greeks suddenly come to their senses realizing they could live without the divinities? Did the Greeks just shake off their old superstitions? Did they conclude Zeus and Apollo were no more than myths? Could it have been that simple? Or did another greater force sweep the ancient world? Before we go there, let's, let's review who these beings were. After all, the Olympic gods dominated the life of the Greeks for almost 2,000 years. Even today, we, we all know of mighty Zeus, the god of thunder. And his two brothers, one the sea god Poseidon and the other the ruler of the underworld, Hades. Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades started it all. And who followed in the pantheon? There's Artemis, whom we spoke about in the last episode. She's a protector of young girls and of wild animals. Animals remember that she delights in hunting. Two, there's Apollo, the god of music and the arts. And others, there's the wise, gray-eyed Athena, always with her owl. And the incomparable goddess of love, Aphrodite. And the fierce god of war, Ares. Zeus had a wife, the always jealous Hera. Then there's the messenger and trickster, Hermes, 
Okay, so we've named 10 gods. The 11th is the ingenious Leonardo of his time, Hephaestus. Then the 12th god, one of my favorites, Dionysus, the seducer and the god of wine. We'll discuss each of these beings in coming episodes. Each was incredibly important. Remember, for the Greeks, these Olympic divinities made the sun rise and the stars shine. They determined whether crops would flourish or cities starve, and even whether brides would be fertile. Amazingly, battles were never fought without armies sacrificing to a god, or sometimes multiple gods. If omens were poor, generals would wait. Omens. It's an interesting word. We hear it often and think of like a bad omen. But omens could be bad or good. They were like prophecies. Omens could be a bird hunched on a dead tree limb, a reluctant lamb having to be dragged to a sacrifice, or something dramatic like an unexpected eclipse of the sun. That happened once when two armies faced off. The sun disappeared, the sky went black, the soldiers fled, and the battle, of course, was postponed. Specialists traveled with every military force. These were diviners who could read omens. Even Alexander the Great depended on fortune tellers before launching an attack. Historians say he was the most superstitious leader and yet the most successful. Omens could be favorable, but often the omens were ominous. In fact, the word ominous is derived from omen. Omens were signs from the gods. They indicated that Ares, for instance, gave his green light for an immediate strike or that Athena warned against doing so. Basically, in all the important moments in a citizen's life, Greeks sought the blessings or the warnings of one god or another. Their importance was incalculable. But let's circle back. If the gods weren't myths, what happened to them? No matter how important the gods were, within several hundred years after Jesus' death, they had essentially become irrelevant. I mentioned Jesus. Am I saying Christianity was to blame? To be candid, no. It, It can't be attributed completely to what was then a new religion. Even before Jesus' birth, the gods' relevance was in marked decline. As early as Socrates, 450 years before Christ, there were those who questioned the existence of the gods. Philosophers would quietly whisper to each other, who has even seen them? In time, educated citizens either ignored the gods or mentioned them only with weary looks or even impertinence, as if Zeus could no longer strike you down with lightning or Poseidon sink your ship if you disrespected his name. Zeus was reputed to have had countless affairs, but when? And more and more commonly, the youth of Athens were taught by philosophers to question rather than accept the fantastic stories of the immortal gods. Gradually, ever so gradually, people decoupled from their dependence on these divinities. Yet the grand temples to Artemis, Apollo, and Zeus still stood proud. At important moments such as weddings and deaths, the old ways and the ancient gods were called upon. Yet otherwise, they no longer played an active role in lives. The Olympic gods no longer struck terror into people like they had done before. You see, the gods seemed no more than tall tales, only oracles such as the Pythia, a young woman at Delphi in a frenzied state induced by the vapors released from the earth, professed to remain in direct contact with these beings. And thus, as the years ticked on, the divinities gradually became sort of mythological. That is, they allowed themselves to become mere actors in a fantastic play that hardly anyone believed to be real. The unimaginable had happened. The Olympic gods, the mighty gods, had become characters in what, for the Greeks, became a hazy and increasingly embarrassing past. Oh, and the embarrassments continued. Around 145 B.C., the Roman Empire conquered Greece. In what must have been humiliating, the Romans renamed Greece Achia. It was no longer Greece, but merely another Roman district. Adding insult, the Romans then renamed many of the Greek gods as well. The gods, like the Greeks, were captured and Latinized. For instance, Artemis became Diana, Ares became Mars, Aphrodite was renamed Venus, and so on. 
Still, the divine traits of the Olympic gods remained, and the practice of sacrifice thrived in Rome as it had in Athens. Sacrifice and temples and sacred priests and vestal virgins were grand theater that worked to the advantage of the Caesars and the Roman generals. Who among us doesn't love spectacle? Yet the populace increasingly winked. The gods had become part of the Roman bread and circus. But there's an irony here. Can you guess? In the same way Rome conquered Greece, Christianity began to slowly conquer Rome. It was a delicious irony that no one could appreciate until many years later. You see, by the time the the new religion began its subversive overthrow of the Roman Empire, a period, by the way, that took four centuries, the gods had, in the minds of many Roman citizens, no more substance than the sacrificial smoke the same gods supposedly craved. Christianity, always the opportunist, slipped into the vacuum left by the Olympians. Yet these divinities, these ancient gods and goddesses, survived. Like chameleons, they changed colors. They became retiring. They abandoned their haughty ways when it served their purposes. How can I best summarize this transition? They simply adapted to the changing world around them. You see, if the gods couldn't be universally worshipped, they shrugged. They simply shrugged and went on. The gods had no ego. Or if they did, it was one that was as malleable as gold. They saw nothing to gain by resisting. In the end, their apparent capitulation to the new religion had its own quirky appeal. What do I mean by that? Well, if they weren't wanted, they would move on. Divinities, you see, could prosper anywhere. After all, they have all the time in the world. Yet for what it's worth, Christianity did accelerate their departure, and as they slowly left, the boldness of the new religion grew. I recommend you check out a book by Catherine Nixie. It's called The Darkening Age. It's a recent scholarly publication about this period, but quite readable. She writes, quote, In a spasm of destruction never seen before, during the 4th and 5th centuries, that would be in our time, uh, 4 and 500 A.D., the Christian church demolished, vandalized, and melted down a staggering quantity of art. Classical statues were knocked from their pinths, defaced, defiled. Temples were razed to their foundations and burned to the ground. A temple widely considered to be the most magnificent in the empire was leveled. She, of course, is discussing the destruction of statues depicting the mighty gods and the raising of their temples. In the end, almost nothing was spared. She details the systematic destruction of all that Greece left behind, the dismantling of what many call the world's greatest civilization, and horrifically, what followed when the church succeeded in its righteous work was a thousand years of darkness. It's what we commonly refer to as the Dark Ages. What the church fathers decimated they couldn't replace. The brilliant Greek achievements were destroyed. The thinkers were silenced, and in the rubble and the smoke, there was nothing to replace them. Mankind would not create such brilliance for over a thousand years. The incomparable was followed by incompetence. Of course, what the early church did was no different than what other religions before and after have done. It's difficult to dispute that humans have a deep need to destroy that which differs from what they believe. And in the case of Greece, a superstitious people simply swapped an ancient belief in multiple gods for belief in a single new one. I'll mention that what I call a swap was not necessarily voluntary. The Roman citizens didn't just decide in mass one day to become Christians, hardly. By 350 AD, Roman authorities who were converts to the new religion issued harsher and harsher laws forbidding worship of the old gods. Obviously, the conversion was a problem, and not all citizens cooperated. Those who refused to convert were mocked as pagans. By the way, the term pagan was a, a slur for country rustics. The so-called pagans were ridiculed as ignorant and obstinate. Their beliefs were scorned and their sacred places destroyed. And in a few centuries, an entire civilization's beliefs, art, and intellectual brilliance were discarded without remorse, and in fact, with general rejoicing. In the end, in that region, the divinities who had presided over the world were gone. The gods had read the cards centuries before and slowly slipped away. 
and it's possible that they had become bored with the adulation. What if being worshipped and constantly implored for favors simply became tiresome after a while? It's possible. Regardless, the time had come for these divinities to move on, and one by one they broke away. Christianity became an excuse for them to bolt. And so they did. Poseidon to his deep, wine-dark seas. Artemis, the unrivaled huntress, to the dense forests of France and Sicily. Athena, gone in a blink with her gray owl. Aphrodite, to exotic islands where she could easily occupy herself on the beaches forever. Dionysus, in a sly disguise. And Ares, the god of war, his operations barely interrupted as men invented ever more violent weapons. He plied his mastery of war to any army with armor and sharp swords, or later, any military with machine guns, tanks, or hypersonic missiles. Almost all countries welcomed his bloody strategies. And Zeus? Although once the greatest of all the gods, Zeus, met a dismal end that had nothing to do with the upstart Christians. In the early years of the Dark Ages, Zeus stupidly dared to confront Gaia, the greatest and earliest goddess. And the confrontation did not go well, not for Zeus, but we'll discuss his his end in the future. Isn't it strange that in the world of so-called classical studies, the word is that the Greek gods dominated the region, then suddenly, as if Zeus had snapped his fingers, disappeared? Their contention is that one day the gods tyrannized all, and then in a blink, they became nothing more than romantic figures of myth. I say their conclusions were flawed. What was that cop-out phrase I quoted earlier from Wikipedia? Greek mythology is a body of myths. You know, even in my teens, I was unconvinced, and, and at that age, you quickly smell a rat. You see, in the eyes of scholars, these mighty gods reigned for thousands of years, and then, uh, then they didn't. Is it even conceivable that in the real world, the Greek gods simply gave up and vanished? Even more absurdly, that they went willingly like cattle to their own sacrifice? Something far more plausible occurred. What was it that really happened to these beings? They spread out across the world, each pursuing his or her own passions. After all, they could bide their time. After all, they are immortals. The fabric of time-space, which defines our existence, does not confine theirs. To immortals... Time means nothing, and they they live forever. In our next episode, we'll discuss Gaia, who, for good reason, plays a key role in the world's creation and in my books. Join us shortly for episode three of Garner's Greek Mythology. This is Patrick Garner, and thanks for listening. Be sure to visit patrickgarnerbooks.com or find me on Amazon. My three novels are set in today's world and feature Greek gods who meddle and maneuver as they always have. Special musical thanks to my talented nephew, Mark Garner with Saraz Handpans, who has graciously gifted us with several of the background pieces in this episode.